Uh, this is a shortened version of the demonstration I've done where I showed how uh, through quite a bit of work uh, I was able to uh, reproduce the Euler V1 hack uh, with Medusa and uh, we're gonna do kind of the high level and then I'll leave you with the logs for you to check them. So uh, first of all the starting code is the Euler code so it's Euler.xyz Euler contracts whereas our code is at uh, Euler V1 recon demo and it's basically uh, going to uh, be a foundry variant of a uh, Euler project which is a hard at contract so to convert from foundry to hard at it's actually straightforward you just grab the version which is uh, 0 0.8.10 and then you uh, have to add a foundry toml and in this case, there's already the remappings, but you will basically just do your free SRC out libs and then the Solsi version. And then you have to install um, Forge STD. If you don't, uh, stuff will break later. So remember to do that. And uh, that's basically all it takes to convert um, the hard hat contracts to Foundry. And once you have a Foundry project, you can use Recon. So I've already set it up here with the IRV1. And basically, we would have access to all of these um, contracts so that we can generate some calls. Uh, but fundamentally, at this stage, which is super early, we will just use the base template so you can download it and just set it up so that in your uh, folder, you basically have test slash recon. And so uh, that's all you will do uh, at the beginning. And that's because the setup, which is the setup file, uh, which if we're not familiar with recon, um, our typical template looks like a setup, which is basically the constructor, the target functions, which are the, the handler functions, the function that will move the story, the properties, which are where you will do the checks. In, our, uh, in this example, we just put them up here just for convenience. And then we have the Creek to Foundry, which is our debugger tool uh, that uh, makes Medusa, Echidna and Foundry all work together. And then you have the critic tester, which is just uh, to basically is the target to pass uh, to the fuzzer. And our before after are basically the ghost variables. In our case, we'll check for the um, an actor being liquidatable. And, and I'll talk about it later as well. So in terms of getting the setup, uh, the main ideas are that Euler was a singleton. And uh, you can see here that uh, you will uh, construct it by passing the owner the admin and then installer module and then the installer module will basically end up setting up kind of these module edit implementation you can check the installer quickly but fundamentally we'll just loop and deploy a proxy and then add it to Euler so that uh, the proxies were uh, the word deployed would actually be called and they would have the ability of delegate calling into Euler uh, so this was a very uh, unique setup and as such it will require a unique uh, you know, set of skills and amount of time to make it work. And you can see uh, that I made this uh, logical separation between singleton and installer module, which is what you start with, and the modules, which is stuff that you add later. Uh, so that's really that will really be the first step. You will have to the, deploy the installer module, deploy the singleton and pass the installer module. And you can see here that uh, since we are not doing uh, Git uh, tracking, we can just pass a random bytes. And then we will uh, grab the actual implementation of the installer module. So this is again is, our, uh, is a choice I made for how to uh, I decided to work with this code base but fundamentally you deploy the logic you install the logic into the singleton and then you grab the proxy version of the logic from the singleton via module ID to proxy so that you can actually interact with it. So that's uh, why we have this pattern and uh, we'll have to repeat that later as well after that we will just grab the modules we need i think i skip a couple i skip the swap and swap hub because we don't need them but perhaps in a more thorough setup you would also have those and then you just install them by passing them as a parameter and uh you whenever you need them such as in this case where i need the governance you would have to do, do this kind of pattern where you uh, grab the module id to proxy of the governance and then you set the governance to this uh, proxy uh, version of it so that you can actually interact with it and that's why our target functions are going to look very simple because we're going to just grab a couple of tokens the e token and the d token and just 
do stuff to them. Uh, but the reality is that the D token and the E token are, are actually the market to underlying D tokens of a debt token and a base token. So there's some complexity that I try to abstract away. Uh, but because we're abstracting away all of that complexity, our target functions would basically look like this. You just go on E token, on uh, uh, Recon, and then D token, and you toggle them. And th th those are basically the target functions, with the exception that we have a sub account ID parameter. And uh, we decided to just clamp that. So uh, to work on a single sub account, we basically just did a uh, find and replace and we, um, we enforce always using the same one. So you'll see in setup that we have a sub account ID set to zero. So that way we work with that. Uh, beside that, what we had to do was set up our tokens. There were a test C 20 provided by um, the Euler repo, so I just use those for base token and debt token, meaning a token I uh, deposit as collateral and a token I borrow. And then we also have oracles for them in IRM, which is the interest rate manager. I found the simplest interest rate manager I could find, basically just returns a random value uh, that is fixed every time. And so uh, that's just the implementation detail. But fundamentally, once the implementation was done, which obviously we had to debug a bit via Credit Foundry, uh, but fundamentally, uh, once implementation is done and the uh, target functions are set, the last thing to do will be to approve the tokens, enter the market so that we can provide the liquidity and borrow. And lastly, we will seed the market by a second recipient by depositing into this temp e-token, which is basically the e-token of the market we intend to uh, borrow from, which is the debt token. And so by doing that, we are offering some liquidity so that obviously the actor has access to more uh, funds than uh, intended. And so uh, uh, that's kind of the high level. The implementation detail that I did to make this happen a bit faster was on the risk manager. First of all, I added the uh, chain link, uh, but it's just not that big of a deal. The main aspect was tied to this uh, liquidity check. You can see that require liquidity, which is basically the liquidity check for uh, Euler, uh, was look uh, like it looked like this, where you have a collateral value that always must be greater than the liability value. And so I created a separate function called is liquidatable that will return whether the liability value was greater than the collateral value. And so anytime that uh, that's broken, uh, you know that you are in, in a liquidation scenario. But because this is an internal module, in order to call it, I also had to change uh, the exec contract. So on the exec, you'll see that I also created this is liquidatable function that will call the internal module, uh, which is the risk manager for, with the is liquidatable parameter. And by doing this, we have a lens into the system and we're able to quickly determine whether a account is liquidatable. Uh, there's probably a better way, but this is the way I found that uh, made the most sense. And it's also a good lesson in, um, uh, in red teaming. Like whenever you're on the red side, you just want to find exploits. You don't necessarily need to uh, you know, protect the code. You can just edit it a bit and it's completely fine because we don't necessarily need to maintain this. Uh, whereas if we had to maintain it, I would probably override the exec with a custom exec or something like that uh, for that purpose. But once you do that and you um, have your setup, you have your target functions and there's some liquidity, then uh, you can basically run it. That's what we did uh, the other day. And fundamentally, um, let's look a bit at the uh, checks first. So fundamentally, I basically added this uh, do check uh, property, uh, but let me show you the repo that I actually run, which is the ORV1 recon demo. And so the um, the best way to you know to basically to set this up was to use the before after uh, ghost variables, and I basically just uh, uh, grab this is liquidatable check from the exec both on the before and the after. And then I created a modifier with checks so that uh, you know every handler will have it and will check. And then once you do that, I basically set up true 
um, functions, a canary function, basically just a check to see if at any time the account can become liquidatable, and then a real uh, check, which is uh, to verify that if the account was not liquidatable before, then it must not be liquidatable after, because the system cannot allow you to liquidate yourself. And so it's important to note that if you add uh, price changing functions, you don't want to add the modifier to update the liquidatable status, because otherwise, obviously, you change the price, nothing has been done on the system, and it will also be liquidatable. So that would be a false positive. But once you set this up in this way, uh, we can basically let uh, Medusa cook, and you'll see that within 45 seconds, uh, probably even less, like in 18 seconds and then 40 seconds of shrinking, you basically find a sequence that will break the canary. So we can just uh, use our tools here, tools slash Medusa to scrape the log. And you can see that the canary basically consists of uh, just changing the price and checking the canary. So there's nothing special about it. Whereas the, maybe a few minutes later, let's say at, uh, yeah, about uh, four minutes in, uh, Medusa was actually able to find the donate to reserve function, which allowed to deposit, borrow, and then donate to these reserves to cause the uh, account to be liquidatable. And so to me, this is, um, there's many takeaways from this, but my personal takeaways are that uh, the difficulty of interacting with the code base definitely didn't help. So if you're a developer, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to set up this type of stuff. An example would be having an internal uh, Solidity test that literally deploys everything and just sends you addresses. That could be a great way to help uh, uh, integrators. And then the second aspect is really tied to the check itself is that um, anytime you have th this scenario where you can go from a no liquidable position to a liquidable position through your own means, and you also have this dynamic uh, premium, um, those are almost always preconditions to a bigger issue. And so uh, as a uh, smart invariant developer, keep that in mind and uh, try and prevent uh, systems from having that. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, literally the instrumentation of the code base took longer than actual uh, the actual check and that's because this type of global properties um, you can introduce them very early in development and you can uh, they can really uh, go a long way in helping you uh, I just don't see a like a better property than this one that uh, shows that there is no way to manipulate this uh, liquidability uh, status so hopefully this was helpful to you. Let me know and have an amazing rest of your day.